as well. Our guest this morning is Dr. Jacob Kennard. I'll introduce Dr. Kennard in just a moment, but we'll start with a prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for the beauty of this morning in Colorado, for the sunshine, and as we are in church for this Lenten season in which you um, call us to remember your Holy Spirit, which guards and guides us into all kinds of different seasons in our life, seasons of, of joy and seasons of sorrow, seasons of, of attentiveness and seasons of relaxation and seasons of work and seasons of recreation. Be with us as we contemplate all of those and enlighten our minds this morning. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So th that is as close to a fly fishing prayer as I have. Um, so Dr. Kennard's topic is the spirituality of fly fishing. And I, I've always heard such good things about Dr. Kennard. He is a professor at Isle of School of Theology, where he was a big influence on um, two of, of our, our staff members. Um, one, Tina Clark, who is Director of Formation of Course. Um, he, he had a particularly profound effect on her, which led to a book um, that, that Tina is working on. And then second, Katie Pearson. Love Dr. Kennard's class on material divinity, uh, the, the, physic, the fabric, the physical um, nature of religious experience. So think about the fabric of buildings, um, think about crosses, icons, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, that she particularly loved that. Um, it is, it's great to have him. Um, one of the things, just to make one connection for all of you that's personal, if any of you remember, um, Dr. Kennard is married to Amy Erickson, who's, who's hands down one of the best speakers that we've had um, in the Dean's Forum. And you'll remember that her, her last topic with us, she's just published a wonderful commentary on the book of Jonah that is spectacular. Um, but we're really here to talk about Dr. Kennard. Um, and, but truly, it's, it's a joy to have you here. And please um, join me in welcoming him warmly to the Dean's Forum. Okay, um, can you help me get this to play so that you don't have to just sit there and look at Amy and me? That, Amy up there. Um, it's been a while since I've been here. Uh, it's nice to be here this morning and I, I, I don't entirely understand what you all are doing here listening on a, to a talk on fly fishing uh, on such a beautiful day, but here you are. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay, good. So. Uh, the title of this talk is Angling and, or maybe for the spiritual. Um, and as I said, usually my partner in crime here would be with me. So I'm going to start out with two quotations. Um, the first is from a 16th century English farmer and poet, uh, an Anglican, uh, by the name of Gervais Markham. And he says, any angler must be a scholar and a grammarian able to write and discourse on his art in true and fitting terms. He must have sweetness of speech to entice others to delight in so laudable an exercise, and strength of argument to defend it against envy and slander. He's talking about fishing here. He must be strong and valiant, valiant neither to be amazed with storms nor affrighted to thunder, and he is not temperate, but has a gnawing stomach. He will not endure fasting, but must observe hours. My, uh, my slideshow is still not working. You got it? OK. Uh, and then the second quotation I want to begin with is from Jimmy Carter, who I think um, you, you, you know who he is. Um, I just saw yesterday that, uh, that he's hanging on at 99, I think. Pretty amazing. Carter says, Carter was a, is, Quite, was quite a fly fisherman. He says, to be able to present the proper fly to rising fish demands the greatest deg degree of determination, studying, planning, and practice. And there is always something more to discover. In the woods or on a stream, my concentration is so intense that for long periods, the rest of the world is almost forgotten. And Carter was known uh, when he was at 
Camp David to sneak off to fly fish for an afternoon uh, while he was present. So let me begin by saying that I usually give talks like this with my fishing partner, Amy Erickson, who's also my wife and adventure companion. But she's on sabbatical and preserving her time as if it is the holy of holies. Um, so you're left with me. The witty and charming half of this partnership is in her study working on uh, a book on the Hebrew Bible nature. So I will do my best. Uh, virtually every discussion of fly fishing and religion and spirituality, of which there are hundreds, makes reference to The Complete Angler, a little book written in 1653 by Sir Isaac Walton, an Anglican priest. It's one of the most printed books in history, ranking up there with the Bible and the Quran. I think it literally is number three in terms of printed books. Among the many little gems in this book, we encounter this one. We may say of angling, angling as Dr. Baudelaire said of strawberries. Doubtless God could have made a better berry, but doubtless God never did so. And if I might be the judge, God never did make a more calm, quiet, innocent recreation than angling. Herbert Hoover was particularly fond of this line. He is another fly fishing former president. There are a lot of little gems in this book, but its pages are full of dry, stale, and sometimes really just tedious prose. The editor of the Oxford Critical Edition of The Complete Angler said that it is a book of great charm, though that charm is due to its apparent artlessness. <laughs> the poet Russell, James Russell Lowell called Walton a club-footed poet. So The Complete Angler may be one of the most printed books in history, but it is also one of the least read. I was given a copy by my English professor mother when I was nine or 10, and I never read the book. So to a scholar such as myself, the popularity of The Complete Angler and the high regard with which it is held by fly fishers in search of spiritual orientation to their angling is a bit of a mystery. Why this strange little book that everyone seems to own but no one seems to have read? My suspicion is that fly fishers want to think that what they are doing is something akin to religion, and the complete angler has come to function something like their Bible, widely owned but not also widely read. <laughs> this leads me to a broader question. Why would contemporary fly fishers wish to conceive of their recreational practice as a meaningful spiritual activity, even a religion? Why claim that this is any more than a hobby like golf or knitting or scrapbooking or woodworking? Is it something about the intricate workings of the fly cast? Think about, uh, um, think about uh, 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 the beautiful image of Brad Pitt throwing those flies uh, in a river runs through it. Um, the ritualized ray this must be performed, the repetitions that must be identical to lay the line and the fly flat on the soft on the water. Is it the mystery of the offerings, bits of feather and fur most often not accepted, but then suddenly and mysteriously received? Is it the art and artifice and the arcane details of tying flies, the mastery of the human over the natural? I could argue that presenting a dry fly to a rising trout is a sacrificial act in the formal religious sense of the term. First, the offering, the fly, must be prepared in a very, very specific way, and it must be made of very specific material, the neck feathers of a barred Plymouth rock rooster, say. The fly must then be presented to the trout in a very particular way. It must be dressed with a desiccant to keep it buoyant, and it must be cast slightly upriver, and it must land exactly where intended, and the line must be mended immediately to prevent unnatural drag, not too much, not too little must then be closely watched for the few seconds it is on the water. And then all this must be repeated over and over and over. Or I could tell you that the fly rod is a ritual implement. Ideally, a fly rod is made of split bamboo, the product of a meticulous process that requires hundreds of hours of precise woodworking. The bamboo is harvested, harvested 
from some secret bamboo grove in the jungles of Assam. It's cut, seasoned, heated, split, sanded, glued, and then sanded some more. The guides are attached by wrapping fine threads thousands of times to which special shellac is applied, and there is the matter of the handle made of cork, the real seat made of exotic hardwood, and so on. Most fly fishers don't make their own rods anymore. Most are now made by, of graphite, actually, and they leave that to the ritual specialist, the aptly named Sage Rye Fly, fly Rod Company, for instance. And most well-made bamboo fly rods are prohibitively expensive. You can spend thousands of dollars for a middling fly rod. Fly lines, too, are entangled in another set of esoterica. Floating lines, sinking heads, belong belly lines, double tapers. And then there's the matter of waders, boots, hats, nets, and so on. Only when the would-be fly fisher is properly equipped, only when he or she has spent hours practicing, hours more in classes, hours and hours reading and watching, only then can he properly present a fly to a rising trout. Some of you may resonate with this. And then there's the matter of tying flies. I confess that I spend countless hours in my little workroom in my basement studying fly patterns, learning about hatches, emergers, and duns, fixing tiny feathers, partridge, rooster, pheasant, col de canard, to tiny hooks and wrapping them with fur from a hare's ear or a beaver's belly. Trout flies are little jewels, tiny works of art, though nothing so magnificent as salmon flies, which are entirely other manner. And I often imagine myself as a kind of Daedalus in my workroom, matching wits with the gods and nature to create something so realistic that trout take it for the real thing. My closer to your mic. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Not used to holding a mic, obviously. These days, I tie my flies with only naturally occurring materials so as to consciously craft them from nature herself. Nothing artificial in my artificial flies. You, you could say, I suppose, that I try to create my flies to be in the image of God's creation. And you could go on to say that the act of tying flies and presenting them to rising trout, we fly fishers are imitating God, imitatio Dei which is, of course, a long, long practice religious activity. This is the sort of thing that religion scholars do when they write articles, the sort of hyper-analysis we engage in. And, of course, it all sounds totally ridiculous. I mean, this is just fishing. For many fly fishers, though, it really is so much more than just fishing. For many fly fishers, Myself included, this is very much a sacred activity. And as Norman McLean put it in A River Runs Through It, the trout stream is a cathedral. And I am obviously in the wrong church this morning, but I should be on the river. But <laughs> I try not to fish on Sunday. There are too many people there. McLean writes, in our family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. We lived at the junction of a great trout river in western Montana, and our father was a Presbyterian minister and a fly fisher who tied his own flies and taught others. He told us about Christ's disciples being fishermen, and we were left to assume, as my brother and I did, that all first-class fishermen in the Sea of Galilee were fly fishermen, and that John, the favorite, was a dry fly fisherman. Now, there are literally hundreds of definitions of religion out there. There are whole books on the topic. I'm not kidding. I went back the other day when I was thinking about this lecture to one of my lectures that I give for my PhD students on the definition question, and I was a little horrified to find that I have 10 single-spaced pages of definitions from various scholars. 10 pages. We can't agree on what it is that we're actually talking about. Depending on where you look, religion is about belief, about God, about ultimate transcendent things. And religion is also very much about practice, about what we eat and what we do, about rituals such as sacrifice and worship and pilgrimage. And it's about how we interact with others, human and non-human. Some definitions focus on the transcendent, the otherworldly, Paul Tillich's religion. It's a state of being grasped by an ultimate concern some religion, religion definitions focus on the ephemeral, while others emphasize the quotidian aspects of religion, the discipline and the codes of conduct 
dietary laws, proper clothing. Roland Burr, one of the more interesting Bible scholars out there, has said this about religion in ancient Israel, cutting right through all this scholarly hand-wringing. If we need to keep using common terminology for religion, the sacred, or even the popular, then I suggest that it should be understood as the ever-present practice of everyday life, carried out by 90% of the population. He goes on to say that the sacred saturated daily life, especially agricultural life, what may appear to us as, as secular was imbued with all manner of assumptions that were also sacred. Religion here is just life. The anthropologist Victor Turner, who dedicated his entire career to studying religious rituals, felt that one key aspect of religious rituals was the affectation of a state he called liminality, by which he meant a kind of betwixt and between, a becoming, of transforming. A haji arrives in Medina, sheds his normal clothes, and dons his white robes, of the, dons the white robes of a pilgrim. He ritually bathes, he has his head shaved, he abstains from sexual activity, and he recites a set of verses from the Quran. And as he works, walks towards the Kaaba, a drop in a sea of millions of other pilgrims, he has lost his individual identity. He's one with all the other pilgrims, rich and poor. Malaysian and Iraqi and British. And with his normal identity race erased, a new collective identity is formed, that of the pilgrim. In this state, he is able to encounter Allah face to face in what we might say is a new purified state. After this liminal experience, which enables him to truly know Allah, he will forever be changed. He will take on the honorific name of Haji, Fly fishing, I think, does affect something like liminality, although perhaps not on such a grandiose scale. You remove your normal pants and you don your waders. You put on your boots with the special studs and you put on your vest with all of its pockets holding your hundreds of flies and tippet and hemostats and floatant. And you put on your lucky hat, you grab your rod and net, your special sunglasses with the magnifier lenses, your wading staff, and you move out into the river. You literally stand in the river, not on dry land. You feel the water moving against your legs. Sometimes you fight against the current and try not to get swept away, especially in June during runoff. You may see fish at your feet. And as you begin to cast, you find yourself concentrating so deeply that you lose your sense of time, of place. In a significant sense, you lose yourself for those hours you were on the river. Your concentration becomes such that you stop thinking about anything but presenting the fly. You stop thinking about the mechanics of your cast, the cold, the wind, and you're just fishing. We don't usually use the word purity to describe fly fishing, but it really is a kind of pure experience. You lose your consciousness. You lose your conscious awareness of yourself fishing, of yourself standing in the water, and it all becomes a kind of oneness. As the old saying goes, give a man a fish and he will eat for a day. Give a man a fly rod and you'll never see him again. <laughs> I admit that this doesn't always or even usually happens. Sometimes I'm distracted by the wind or the cold or low flows or high flows by a lack of fish or lack of insects or by other fishers on my sacred river, no less. And when this loss of self does happen, it's something magical. A Zen moment of being one with the river, the river that is constantly moving and changing, being one with the fish, the trees, the birds, the mayflies, the caddis, all of it. Call it nature, call it the sublime, call it God. Why not? A kind of transcendence of the self happens. That, to me, is a spiritual religious experience. Isaac Walton, despite the bizarre oddity of his prose, actually gets at something of this when he writes, so when I would beget content and increase confidence in the power and wisdom and providence of Almighty God, I will walk the meadows by some gliding stream and there contemplate the lilies that take no care and those very many other various living creatures that are only created but fed, man knows but not how, by the goodness of the God of nature and therefore trust in him. 
Contemplate the lilies, he says. You may recognize this passage from the Bible, both from Matthew and Luke, but it's really a good metaphor for fly fishing. I regularly teach a comparative religions course on pilgrimage. It's a popular class. Students are drawn by the idea of pilgrimage, the idea of going on a journey to the divine, the idea of leaving home and family and work behind and hitting the road, joining like-minded seekers. The students are attracted to the communal asceticism it promises, the mix of adventure and spirituality. They see it as a minimalist, authentic way to encounter the ultimate. They are perhaps understandably disappointed then when they learn that pilgrimage is often a crowded, dirty, miserable experience. More of an encounter with the commercial than the spiritual. They read of pilgrims who are overwhelmed by the busyness of the Hajj, pilgrims in Benares who incense that temple priests just want their money, or that fake holy relics were regularly sold to unwitting medieval pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. A sacred bath is often a disgusting experience, the water filthy, the elbows of fellow pilgrims sharp. I went and spent a day hiking up a steep, dry, blazing, hot mountain in northern India to visit a sacred cave temple only to find an empty, hollow, mud hut. The thing about the quest for the spiritual is that it often one leaves, leaves one empty-handed. One of our favorite places to fish is Cheeseman Canyon. And if you've never been to Cheeseman Canyon, you should drive out and take a little hike out there. It is a s just stunning place. This is actually a shot from Cheeseman Canyon. It's a five mile strip of the South Platte that flows out of Cheeseman Dam, which is a majestic structure that was created in 1905 to create a reservoir to supply the city of Denver with reliable water. The image of the modern dam is not a positive one, of course. Dams have done tremendous damage to America's waterways, blocking native fish from their spawning grounds, creating artificial bodies of water that have been exploited by all manner of industry. Cheeseman, though, is not a typical dam. It stands at just over 200 feet. It was built in the existing rock structure, and to come on it is often to miss it because it blends into its natural surroundings. Water spills from the right side of the dam and cascades down the natural rock, a rush of white that at first glance appears to be natural waterfall. It, it looks like a temple, actually. The river below is what fly fishers know as a tailwater, and as such, it is both a magnificent place to fish, even during Colorado's harsh winters, and a decidedly unnatural body of water. It is fed from huge valves at the bottom of the river, which keep the river temperature unnaturally stable too warm in the winter to freeze, cool enough in the summer to allow trout to thrive. Cheeseman's trout are wild, or rather wild-ish, whereas most rivers in Colorado and in the United States at large are stocked with trout, fish that have been raised in hatcheries and held in great cement ponds and fed with compressed pellets of meal and then transported in trucks and pumped by the thousand from fire hoses into the rivers, literally. Cheeseman's brown and rainbow trout have been raised in the river. Stocking stopped in the 1980s as environmental groups and wildlife biologists began to see the value of wild populations of fish. This is part of what makes Cheeseman a kind of bucket list fishery, drawing anglers from all over the world. Recently, we were fishing in the lower canyon, and a young man came bounding out of the willows, decked in high-end waders and boots. It's amazing after the pandemic, everybody seems to have gone out and spent thousands and thousands of dollars on fly fishing gear without knowing how to fly fish. Um, but he came bounding out of the willows, decked in all of this stuff, and his eyes wide, and he said to us, my God, it's better than the pictures. We felt the same when we first saw it. This section of the South Platte is one of the most stunning rivers anywhere careening down a canyon lined with steep granite cliffs and towering ponderosa pines. There are deep pools and long riffles, little waterfalls, cascading rapids. It's like a kind of idealized trout stream. The water released from the bottom of the dam carries with it the reservoir's nutrients and insects, meaning that there is always a rich source of food flowing down the river. Cheeseman's trout are healthy, strong, and often very large. When Amy and I first started fly fishing, we were utterly intimidated by the canyon, as it's called locally, the definitive article giving it a kind of gravity and authority in much the same way that someone might refer to 
the cathedral or the temple. We'd read the often repeated phrase that if you can catch fish in Cheeseman Canyon, you can catch fish anywhere. And we interpreted this to mean rightly, as it turns out, that the trout are particularly difficult to catch in this stretch of water. The other word that gets used is technical, which is a kind of fly fishing code denoting the likelihood of leaving the water without having caught any fish, skunked in the vernacular. We would hike into the canyon with a kind of hopeful resignation and we would tell each other that it was enough to be out, to be on the water, the catching of fish was just a bonus. In other words, we would go expecting to be disappointed, expecting that we would not, in fact, find what we were seeking. This only heightened the uh, mystique of the place, the sense of awe and wonder of it all. We would meet fellow anglers on the trail and they would, as always, ask how we did and as often as not, they would reply to our admission of fishing failure with their own. We were, it seemed, part of a brotherhood of the skunking. Isaac Walton, as befitting a priest, used the brotherhood of the angle to describe his fishing buddies. And to those anglers who replied, oh, pretty good, I got five, we would respond with a mixture of wonder and incredulity. It seemed then that whatever knowledge and skill it took to catch fish in the canyon was decidedly esoteric, and we weren't sure who would teach us. We read all the books, all the articles, all the blogs. We took classes. We grilled every angler we met, asking about fly patterns and hook size and split shot and tippet. We tried the early mornings, the late afternoons. We tried cloudy days, high flows, low flows. None of it seemed to make a difference. For the better part of the year, we caught no fish. Seriously. We spent hours and hours on the river, walking the whole length of it. In my despair, I seemed to have missed an important lesson from my own course. Pilgrimage isn't really about the destination. It's about the journey, about the experience, and yes, about suffering. I think of pilgrims rolling for hundreds of miles to a temple in India, to Muslim pilgrims crawling the last kilometer to Karbala, to the pilgrims who died on the journey in medieval Europe. You have to suffer. Although there certainly can be something transactional about religion and especially about sacrifice and pilgrimage, it is a quid pro quo dynamic, this for that, an offering for a boon. That's only part of the dynamic. One of our assumptions when we first started fishing was that we were, able, we were there to take something from the river, trout. And to do that, we had to master it, the canyon, the river, the bugs, the fish. So we sort of thought that if we had the right stuff, the right gear, we could find what we wanted from Cheeseman Canyon. But what in the end did we want? It took us a while to realize that fly fishing isn't about actually about catching fish, about getting them in the net. If it were, much of the time, it would be a failure. This often puzzles non-fishers. Rather, fly fishing is about the cultivation of a reciprocal mutual relationship, a relationship with and in nature. Yes, there's no question that we are hunting when we are fly fishing. And even when we practice catch and release, as we always do, there is a violent reality of plunging a sharp hook through the flesh of a fish and dragging it through the water. One shouldn't get too romantic about all of this. It's a predatory act. We try to be participants in nature, and part of this is as hunters. That's in our nature. We try to, we, like that's in our nature, like it or not. As the wise teacher of my hunter safety course said, we have eyes in the front of our heads. This means something. We evolved to be predators, hunters. But as anyone who has ever seriously hunted knows, hunting is about knowing the animals, knowing the terrain, knowing the environment. You can't just be in nature. You have to be with nature. Robin Wall Kimmerer, a Native American botanist who infuses the wisdom of indigenous traditions in all of her work, talks about why gratitude as an ecological and a spiritual practice matters. In the teachings of my Potawatomi ancestors, she writes, responsibilities and gifts are understands as two sides of the same coin. The possession of a gift is coupled with the duty to use it for the benefit of all. A thrush is given the gift of song and so has responsibility to greet the day with music. Salmon have the gift of travel, so they accept the duty of carrying food upriver. When we fish or when we hunt or hike, Amy and I are deeply committed to being responsible and caring. 
we try to cultivate and practice the sort of gratitude that Kim River is talking about. We try to give at least as much as we take. Kim River says that when we ask ourselves, what is our responsibility to the earth? We are also asking, what's our gift? Put another way, what do we give back to the river? It's an important question, and most fly fishers I know want to give back to reciprocate all the gifts they get from the river. And here, I don't mean just for the actual fish, but for the whole riparian experience. This is why so many fly fishers support an organization like Trout Unlimited, which works to restore and enrich river habitats. We give not only money, but many hours in the river, collecting trash, restoring the banks and runs, building sustainable trails, reestablishing native fish populations. And if you like the ducks that we have in Denver, if you go to Wash Park and you see all the ducks, the bergansers and the ringnecks and the widgeons and the gadwalls and the wood ducks and so on, you should thank a hunter, because Ducks Unlimited, which since 1938 has raised millions of dollars, has been absolutely crucial for the restoration of duck habitat. Last year alone, that organization raised $318 million for that purpose. They go out and shoot ducks, but duck hunting uh, is only a little tiny part of what they do. In every relationship and interaction one has, then, one has the opportunity to practice gratitude and generosity. I regularly find myself, upon releasing a trout, saying out loud, thank you. And I'm standing there in the middle of the river by myself. I'm saying this to the fish and to the river, and I suppose to the universe. I'm expressing gratitude for being part of this experience. And of course, in all of this, one is given the gift of learning. One of the many reasons I fish is because I want to learn from the river about what generosity and balance look like, what it means to participate and show restraint, what it means to be part of a living, moving, changing physical environment. I want to be in nature, but also of nature. I want to learn lessons that I couldn't possibly foresee learning, to learn from the trout, the mayflies, the dippers, the caddis. It's a radical act, actually, to place yourself in the middle of the non-human world and to say, I'm here to learn and I don't know what, or even more importantly, I don't know what for. I trust, I have faith, that the learning will emerge as I deepen my relationship on and with the river. And of course, often it takes years to understand what one has learned. This sensibility is evident in the religious worldview known as animism. Animism is often misunderstood as a primitive belief, a system of belief that imputes life or spirit to things that are truly inert. The anthropologist Tim Ingold describes it instead as the recognition of the dynamic transformative potential of the entire field of relations within which beings of all kinds, more or less person-like or thing-like, continually and reciprocally bring one another into existence. In this view, the world is full of persons, only some of whom are human. Graham Harvey, in his book, Animism, Respecting the Living World, says that life is always lived in relationship with others. Personhood, he says, is not a given, but is made by producing and reproducing sharing relationships. And in animist practice, relationships, whether they're human or elephant or boulder or plant, they rely on etiquette, on respect, on generosity, and on gratitude. It's about social interactions and the social weaves all the way through nature, through humans, other mammals, fish, insects, plants, rocks. Such a view has the possibility of radically expanding our understanding of relationships. And it strikes me as a wonderfully suitable way to think about ecology and ethics. Indeed, as I've tried to demonstrate here, the long traditions of fly fishing emphasize etiquette, respect, generosity, and gratitude. As someone pointed out to me recently, if you don't care all about all of that, you might as well fish with nets. Or hell, you might as well fish with dynamite. My students at ILIF these days are increasingly not church people. I'm thinking about the fact that two of my students, former students, are here. Um, but 
they increasingly don't think of themselves as church people. They often are not even religion people, but what the pollsters call knots, as in spiritual but not religious. I certainly get that. I want to say, though, that like McLean, fly fishing is my religion, and the rivers that Amy and I fish on are our great cathedrals. It is there that we find the connections and the relationships that new animists are talking about. Call it religion, call it spirituality, but if I'm honest, it's there that I find the divine. A poem that has stayed in my head for over 40 years now seems a fitting place to end today. It's by Gerard Manley Hopkins, and it was written in the last quarter of the 19th century. Hopkins left the Anglican church in midlife and became a Catholic priest. He was inspired and influenced by the romantic poets, especially by Wordsworth and also by the Bible. You might hear echoes of Psalm 148 here. It may well be that I have loved this poem simply because it praises trout and it celebrates all the gear I have acquired over the years. The poem is called Pied Beauty. Glory be to God for dapple things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in a stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plow, and all trades, their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever's fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, the dazzle dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Thank you. And I'm told that um, I have to leave time for questions here, so I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Yes, sir. I noticed in your slide presentation you had a shot of a, a small camper. Yes. Whenever yeah. you go fishing, do you make it a two or three day event or just an afternoon? Right. I'm sorry. Say, I'm, 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 I'm deaf in one ear. So. No, no, no problem. Whenever you and your wife go fishing, do you make it like a three or four day event or just an afternoon? Yeah, so, uh, so <laughs> for a while we had a little, um, a little tab camper, a little mini camper, and we would go, we actually went all over the place. We've been Wyoming, Montana, New Mexico. We did an epic um, road trip a few years ago. Um, we both went to school, we both went to college in Maine, so we did a road trip to Maine. And uh, it was kind of a pilgrimage. We were in search of brook trout, um, which we don't really have in Colorado. And we were particularly in search of these giant brook trout that are all over the East Coast. And we went in the dead of summer. We didn't catch a single fish, um, <laughs> but we had fun. So, so that, uh, and then uh, a few years ago, about six years ago, uh, we decided to sell the camper and we bought a little house up in Divide, which is near 11 Mile Canyon to be closer to fishing. So, so um, if, I, if I had my druthers, I would just always really be in a camper by the side of a river somewhere, but you know, yeah. Let's see, Jacob, I've got a couple um, and they're totally unrelated. So I'll do the first one is, does, and I wish Dr. Erickson were here so I could ask her. Yeah, directly. I wish she were here too because but, uh, um, <laughs> she's a lot more fun than I am. <laughs> so does, does her the enjoyment of, of fly fishing, did it influence her decision to do about a 500 page commentary on the book of Jonah? Uh, that's a good question, right? We used to always, actually we were on the road uh, one summer when she was writing and so she would she would sit at the little table in our camper and write, and I would go out and fish for a while. Um, no, uh, she had agreed to do that before we started fishing. And, and I, I've been fishing since I, I got my first fishing rod when I was six years old. Um, so I've fished my entire life. Uh, Amy had never fished before. Uh, and so, uh, so no, she, she actually, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't uh, have anything to do with that book, but the book she's writing now, absolutely. Mm. Um, 
she's a bug geek. Mm -hmm. She likes she likes insects, and so she gets very involved in the yeah. life of mayflies. All right, second question. What are your thoughts on um, kind of stepping back from fly fishing? You, you've got your day job at ILF, and, and then you do this on, on, on weekends and vacations and whenever you can steal away. What, what are your thoughts on a, a rhythm of uh, work, however defined, and, and, and not work or, or recreation and, and, and times apart? Yeah, I think the one, and, and anyone who ever engages in any kind of activity where you find that, that kind of calm I'm talking about, I think the one allows the other. And I think the time on the river allows me to be a different kind of yeah. scholar and a different kind of teacher. Yeah. I think it, it, it gives me a different sort of sense of calm, but it also gives me a different sense of concentration. I found, uh, you know, having gone through a, a really ridiculous graduate program at the University of Chicago and had to learn all these languages, I actually found after I started fly fishing that my ability to concentrate had increased uh, my ability to focus. So, and, and I really, and it's changed my teaching. Um, I know that uh, uh, Tina took, took the class Amy and I taught on wilding religion. I never would have taught a class like that had I not, uh, had I not been a fly fisher. You know, mm, so. Thank you. Are there other, other questions? Yes, coming to you, Kate. Hold on a second. Hey, Kate, if you don't mind, yeah, yeah. sorry. So, yeah, how, so that's, a, that's a really good, how, how do you get started? Hey, will you repeat the question? Yeah, so how do you get started in fly fishing? Um, it's, it's one of the more intimidating activities you can take on. Because as I try to, I try to emphasize, I mean, there's, it's so esoteric. There's so much you have to learn. Um, so Orvis, uh, you know, the big lifestyle company that Orvis has become, Orvis regularly offers classes. Uh, you just go out with somebody on the South Platte down, down, downtown and you throw some flies. And it's a way to get, just sort of figure out what, what it looks like. They also offer beginning fly, fly tying classes. But I think the best way is just to just get out on the water. Yeah, buy a cheap fly rod with a line and, and just go out and, especially in the summer when the fish will take big bugs off the top of the water, that's an easy time to do it. But um, I have to say, we were, we, I mean, it was kind of like joining a new religious group, but we were utterly intimidated when we first started to fly fishing because everybody seemed to have this language that we didn't know and all this technique and so, yeah. Other questions? So I've got, you sure, anyone? Okay, great. I've got one or two more. Um, <laughs> I, I would love it if you would say, um, yeah, I actually do have two more. This is so much fun um, for me. Um, so, you know, you use that Norman McLean quote, which is just a spectacular book and quote, and that that's the cathedral and those walls. And, and then I'm thinking about how... Um, like the canopy in a cathedral mirrors a, a canopy in a forest. All right, and then you've got the stones which mirror stone walls. And so you've got this fascinating, religion's fascinating because it's, it's, it's playing off of our experiences in the natural world. And it's absolutely a both and. And that's what I hear you saying in some ways. I know you made the joke rightly about, you know, not, not going up to fish on Sundays, not exactly because you needed to be in church, but because of how many people are up there in that other church. But I'd, I'd, love, I'd love for you to say a word about just that, that fluidity, and this is especially appealing for Episcopalians. There, there's not a sacred and a secular world. The, these lines between what we call religion, religious experience, and non-religious experience are at best ambiguous in the light of God's presence. Yeah, I, and that was kind of the point I was trying to make there with these definitions, that, that scholars sit in their studies and they come up with these very erudite definitions. But in fact, as Roland Bohr says, there, there traditionally wasn't a distinction between the secular and the sacred. That's an odd move to make, right? And it, I think it's kind of interesting or maybe incidental that, that so many of the early writers on fly fishing were Anglican priests, right? And that partly meant that they had a little time. 
you know, on the non-Sundays they could get out on the river. But they found, and you see this in the romantic poets uh, of, uh, of, the, of the 18th and early 19th century, you see them looking at nature and seeing a reflection of the divine in nature and then vice versa, right? And so they, they're, they're, and I think one of the things that, that the, the movement that gets called new animism is trying to get at and trying to learn from native traditions and really learn, not co-opt, is that the distinction between the secular and the sacred makes no sense. Uh, and, it, and you see this in the movement that gets known as pantheism in the 19th century, right? So that the idea that the grandeur of God, the grandeur of the divine, is in, in, in everything. And I think of that line from Wordsworth, to see eternity in a something or other, something or other, but, but that's, that's the idea. So, so I think, and I think that the thing that, I mean, anybody, you know, we live in Colorado, everybody gets out in nature. And what you, what you learn is that the experience in nature enriches your experience out of nature and vice versa, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's amazing, thank you for that. So, so one more question, coming to you here, I'll talk, give me just a second. So you mentioned that um, you practice catch and release. Uh, so is it, is it wrong to eat the fish any more than to eat a deer that you might shoot? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I absolutely, um, and, and in hunting, you, you, you can't catch and release, right? And there's a real ethic about using every little bit of the animal that you've harvested. I hate that language. A few years ago, I actually convinced Amy that we needed to start eating our fish. Um, and, and, in, and in many European countries, they find catch and release barbaric because they see that as just playing with the fish, right? So if you're gonna catch it, you should eat it. And so um, we went out a few times and we, we, caught, we, we kept a few of the fish and I came home and cooked them. And, um, and honestly, it felt like eating your pet. Uh, it, it, it was a really strangely uncomfortable experience. Um, but I would say, you know, I would say yes, I think that, and especially fish in a place like Chief Canyon, where it's not a natural fishery, um, it actually very, it helps the fishery to harvest a few fish. So if, if I were, if I had more integrity, I would eat what I catch. Um, but I don't, and I, and I struggle with that, right? I struggle with the fact that I'm, I'm recreating at the expense of these wild animals, no question. Um, yeah. From what you just described, is like they're a, a cheeseman, would you say a, a, the, the trout are like a keystone species? Um, in the sense that, well, The, um, the fact that they're responsible for so much, whether yeah. it's eating the yeah. bugs yeah. or yeah. Uh, um, whatever. I don't, know. I don't know if there is a keystone species there. I, I think what, what, what you see on a river fundamentally is the symbiosis of it all, is the ways in which the birds and the fish and the insects are all part of the life of that river, and then the trees, and, and so I, I'm not sure I'm not sure Keystone exactly works, but they're absolutely fundamental to the life of the entire habitat and the bears and, and, and everything. So, and that's part of the experience. That's part of, it's, it's the opportunity to get out and feel yourself part of this, a very small part of this very large whole, if that makes sense. Before we thank you, one last one for me. I, I would love. To, I mentioned at the beginning that Katie Pearson says she loves your class on material divinity, and I actually would like to end there. So we've we've, uh, especially as Episcopalians and, and and members and friends of the cathedral, um, the the fabric of religious experience is hugely important to all of us. I mean, think about going to the cathedral, the stained glass, the lift. We just had Ash Wednesday. The literal of the ash material that that is put on your forehead in the shape of the cross, which communicates so much wor more than words do. Would you say a word about your, your class and the themes from that? Yeah, I, I started teaching this class because my own, uh, my own field is actually Buddhist art. And, and I work on 
material, what we call material culture, things, right, and how they function in, and in the Indian context, an image, if you see an image, it's not simply a, a, a thing of stone. It's actually a living, breathing, embodied God, right? So, so when you see an image that's been ritually treated, it, it really is God being present or the divine being present. Um, and I think that that's a really important part of, I mean, you're, you're saying this in, in the context of the Anglican of the Episcopal Church, right? So you're saying this because you, this is a religious tradition that is rich with things, right? They matter. They're not just mere objects, right? And so, and I think that that enriches our sense of, uh, of, of religiosity. I was teaching a course um, the other day and uh, we were talking about this very topic and the way in which objects can take on a kind of meaning that is much more than their material. And I use this example, I have this rolling pin um, that my father made when I was about five, I think. So it's, you know, it's almost 60 years old. And he made this rolling pin out of, uh, out of walnut that had been harvested from his farm. He was a farmer, a sheep farmer uh, uh, be before I was born. And he made this rolling pin on a lathe, and I remember actually being in his workshop when he made the, right? And, and I've had this thing for, for th you know, 40 years probably, 35 years. And it's just a rolling pin. Yeah. It's just a piece of wood, but it means so much more to me than that. And I, I have two rolling pins. It's the only one I ever use. And if I lost it, I would feel like I'd lost part of myself. And I use that example because I think people resonate with the fact that Objects are more than objects. They're imbued with meaning that's memory of, of, of a tactile nature, right? So when we're talking about the sacred, but in terms of objects, we're talking about actually really the entire spectrum of human experience, right? And, and the de our definition from that, that's an old, old one, I know you've heard it, and it predates Anglicanism, but is that sacraments are outward and visible signs mm -hmm. of inward and spiritual grace. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And, and, and often these objects are really ordinary in our lives. Yeah. Bre bread, wine, yeah. ashes, right. Uh, right. wedding bands. Right. And I would say, I would say for me, uh, the river's like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm not, I'm actually not a religious person, but I am. <laughs> because when I, when I see a, when I see, and I almost, the thing about Cheeseman, you go there and almost every time I'm there, I yeah. see at least one bald eagle, right? Yeah. No matter how long you lived in Colorado, yeah. seeing a bald eagle is like something, like it really does feel yeah. like you're seeing the divine there. Yeah. You know? ah, that, what a perfect place to end. Um, Jacob, we're really grateful. This, oh, well, this is just outstanding and fascinating. Out Sunday morning. <laughs> Uh, thanks to everybody who joined us online as well. Next service is at 1030 a.m., same place, sjcathedral.org. God bless you and take care during the